Welcome to today's press review with me, Carmen Cracknell. Today we'll take a look at peace talks between Israel and Palestine as we're joined in a discussion by political analyst Stephen Sizer. We'll also take a look at growing divisions between Islamist groups in Syria as we continue coverage of the ongoing Syrian crisis. But first, let's take a look at the front pages here in the UK. The Guardian leads its front page, reporting on the Old Bailey convicting Michael Adebalajo and Michael Adebawale of murdering Fusilia Lee Rigby in the Woolwich attack, as it focuses on the dignified conduct of the victim's family. The Independent also leads its front page on Adebalajo and Adebawale's conviction and Rigby's family's dignity through the trial. The paper also says that at least one of the killers had been on the radar of security service and police for years, raising questions on whether the MI5 could have prevented the murder. The Daily Telegraph leaves its front page reporting on late-breaking news from London's West End, where more than 80 theatre-goers were injured by the collapse of part of the ceiling at the Apollo Theatre. It also reports on Fusilia Lee Rigby's murder, saying that British soldiers are at risk from thousands of lone wolf terrorists. The Times, like many other papers, also leads with the news of Rigby's murder, reporting that MI5 had extensive contact with 29-year-old Ada Balajo and tried to recruit him as an informant after he was arrested in Kenya in 2010. The paper also reports on the Children's Commissioner, saying that teachers, social workers and doctors should be forced to report suspicions of child sex abuse and features a pic picture of the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh as they begin their Christmas break at Sandringham. Now let's take a look at the top stories in the Middle East. As two Palestinians are shot dead in West Bank and Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu vows to continue building settlements, let's take a look at what analysts are saying on negotiations between Palestine and Israel. Writing for Al Monitor, Maz Al Mualim takes a look at Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu speaking at the Likud Convention in her article, Netanyahu delivers hardline speech at Likud Convention. Mualim says, as if no agreement had been signed between the world powers and Iran, and with the same old threatening rhetoric, Prime Minister Netanyahu dedicated a large part of his speech on December the 18th at the Likud Party Convention to the Iranian nuclear program. His bottom line hasn't changed either. Israel will not accept a nuclear bomb. She adds that the speech was anachronistic, lacking in vision and most of all detached from the international reality. Only in Netanyahu's world has time been frozen, not only on the Iranian front but also on the Palestinian question. Netanyahu spoke as if US-sponsored negotiations haven't been taking place in the last few months and declared with a nod to the extreme right, we won't stop building the land for a minute. Mualim says that it seems that Netanyahu took several steps backward from the position he expressed in his June 2009 Bar Ilan speech at the beginning of his last term as Prime Minister and returned to the familiar verbal sparring with the Palestinians. Mualim adds that the sense he left at the end of his remarks, however, was of a Prime Minister who's burying his head in the sand. It is as if Netanyahu refuses to recognise the fact that in the near future the internal and international political realities will close in on him and that he will have to make decisions on the Palestinian issue. Mualim says that these are not the words of a leader in whose name accelerated diplomatic negotiations are now taking place with the goal of solving the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians on the basis of a two-state solution. There was not a trace of an effort in his speech to prepare the hearts and minds of the Israeli public for a historic agreement with the Palestinians. Finally, she says that as long as there is no politician who represents a significant leadership alternative among the Israeli public, Netanyahu can do almost anything he wants, or alternatively, he can do nothing and continue to hold power. In other words, this week too, there are no reasons or signs to think that Netanyahu is headed towards a historic decision. Joshua Mitnick writes for the Wall Street Journal, focusing on longtime lead Palestinian negotiator Saib Arakat in his article, Palestinian Negotiator Lays Out View on Israel Talks. 
Mitnick says that Erekat is knee-deep in Israeli-Palestinian peace talks despite tendering his resignation to President Mahmoud Abbas in October over Israeli settlement announcements, a gesture repeated several times over the 20 years of talks but never fully acted on. Mr Abbas has declined to accept his resignation. Mitnick notes that answering speculation that there hasn't been enough progress in the four months left before a deadline for a deal and that the best the sides could hope for is a partial interim agreement, Erekat said a breakthrough on permanent agreement is still very doable by the deadline. However, it will take six to 12 months after that to fully complete negotiations. Minnick adds that he said negotiators are seeking a broad framework deal that would outline basic compromises on borders, settlements, Jerusalem, refugees and security arrangements in the West Bank. Filling in the nitty-gritty for a full-fledged peace treaty would require more time. A key point that Mitnick notes is that Erekat signalled publicly for the first time that Palestinians will accept some presence of Israeli soldiers on the West Bank border with Jordan and suggested that a gradual withdrawal would be acceptable like Israel's exit from the Sinai Peninsula two years after a peace treaty with Egypt. It's a significant statement because until now Palestinians reject the idea that Israeli soldiers will remain behind after a deal. However, Mitnick also highlights that although Eric Karp thinks peace is still possible, he said that the current Israeli policy to expand settlements is destroying those prospects. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, however, argues that it's not settlements that are the obstacle to peace, but rather the Palestinian refusal to recognise Israel as the historic homeland of the Jewish people. To conclude, Mitnick says that Though Mr. Erekat's resignation still stands, there's no indication that the Palestinian president is looking to fill the shoes of aid, who says he's devoted his life to negotiations as the clock winds down on a deadline for a deal, even if his outlook is gloomy. Writing for The Global Research, Jonathan Cook takes a look at Kerry's involvement in the peace talks in his article Kerry's Framework Agreement, the West Bank, modelled on Gaza, the fiction of a Palestinian state. Cook says in recent days, US and European diplomats have been engaged in a frenzy of activity on the Israeli-Palestinian front before they settled down for the usual two-week Christmas hibernation. He adds that a sense of urgency looms because Washington is supposed to unveil next month its so-called framework proposal for the creation of a Palestinian state in a last desperate effort to break the logjam in negotiations. For this reason, the outlines of the US vision of an agreement are finally coming into focus. And as many expected, the picture looks bleak for the Palestinians. Cook believes that John Kerry, US Secretary of State, who has invested much of his personal standing in a successful outcome, has grown increasingly forthright that an agreement hinges on satisfying Israel's security concerns, however inflated. Cook adds that the US Secretary of State is offering an Israeli security plan at the expense of meaningful Palestinian statehood, referring to the Jordan Valley. That is not entirely surprising, given that the plan was drafted by John Allen, a general formerly in command of US forces in Afghanistan, who has spent six months quietly liaising with Israeli counterparts. Cook says the new proposal should be a deal-breaker. The valley is a vital resource for the Palestinians, one they've been effectively stripped of for decades by Israel's exaggerated security needs. He adds that given the essential conflict between Israel's security requirements and the Palestinian demand for statehood, how does Kerry intend to proceed? Cook answers saying, that too is becoming clear. The task of making Israel and the Palestinians play ball is being subcontracted to the European Union. That makes sense because as the main subsidizer of the occupation, the Europeans have major financial leverage over both parties. Cook concludes that however vigorous the EU's arm-twisting, the reality is that the Palestinian leadership is being cajoled into an agreement that would destroy any hope of a viable Palestinian state. Abbas is said to have viewed the US plan as worse than bad. His agreement to it would be worse than disastrous. Joining us today is political analyst Stephen Sizer. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah. Uh, Following the shooting of the two Palestinians in the West Bank on Wednesday and Netanyahu's recent announcement of further settlement buildings, do you still see an agreement being reached? No, I don't. Um, 
we gave up on the two-state solution long ago because it's very clear that Israel is not serious about withdrawing to the 1967 borders or anything approximating that. Uh, they are committed to um, expanding their colonization of the West Bank uh, until they reach the Jordan River, hence the, ne the next agenda being the Jordan Valley. They've annexed it. Uh, they are depriving Palestinians of access to the most fertile part of the West Bank, and uh, they are basically turning the isolated pockets of Palestinian uh, life, the urban urban uh, areas, if you like, Nablus, Janine, Ramallah, Chilkam, Jericho, Bethlehem, and Hebron, into Bantistans, into small pockets um, entirely surrounded by uh, Israeli settlers. This mm. is not a state. Yeah. This and, is not a two-state solution. Yeah, and what message is Netanyahu sending by continuing to build settlements, especially following the release of Palestinian prisoners, taking into consideration that he was warned not to by Europe and America? Well, they do this all the time. They, they, they give uh, you one inch and they take a mile. Mm. Um, they they, they uh, capture Palestinian children as well as uh, adolescents and, and adults. Uh, they hold them as political prisoners and then periodically they release a few to show how compassionate they are. And then at the same time, they expand their settlements. So their actions are predictable. Uh, we anticipated them. And it's very clear that there is no uh, solution, uh, a two-state solution possible. Uh, they are creating a land allegedly with no people into a land of no people uh, by uh, de de legitimizing and uh, denying the right to exist in Palestine for Palestinians. And this is intolerable and acceptable. Mm. And, um, you know, the latest um, statements coming out of the U.S. administration merely show that they are following a Zionist agenda that's been there from the very beginning. Yeah. Why do you think John Kerry is so keen to push for the negotiations? Well, every successive uh, prime minister, uh, sorry, president in the United States has wanted to be the man who signed the peace deal mm. and, uh, and, and got Palestine and, and Israel uh, to, to, um, to reach an agreement. Uh, but it's very clear that what is being offered is not statehood, is not independence, not contiguity, and therefore it's a sham. It's, it's no better than what the United States administration offered the indigenous Indians in North America. They offered them reservations on which they could uh, have, their, uh, have their gambling and, uh, and their animals and progressively be deprived of more and more of the best land by the uh, American settlers. The Israelis are doing exactly the same to the Palestinians. And uh, we should wake up to the fact that this is um, a form of apartheid that is being tolerated and sponsored and endorsed by uh, the world's superpower. Some interesting points there. Thank you very much for joining us, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks. As divisions grow between Islamist groups in Syria, let's take a look at what the papers are saying. Zvi Bar El has written an analysis in Haaretz titled Dividing Factions Add Up to Total Chaos in Syria with No Solution in Sight, saying that Western intelligence is trying to figure out which group to choose as a partner for dialogue among the various competing Islamists. Bar El says that when Washington engages with Jabhat al-Nusra at Geneva II, it can't be sure that the front will not also contain al-Qaeda elements or members of the gangs of murderers who just over a week ago were involved in beheadings in the town of Adra in the Damascus district. Bar El adds, the map of the Islamic groups operating in Syria is like an amoeba constantly splitting in chaos and violence, sometimes joining with others and sometimes split from them, leaving behind heaps of bodies of civilians who were unable to flee. Bar El says the new Islamist front has 15 groups. He continues, the split among the Islamist groups is based, among other things, on the countries that give them money and logical support. For example, Turkey supports the relatively moderate Islamic Front, and until recently, Saudi Arabia supported the branch of the Martyrs Brigades of Syria in the city of Idlib and the Free Syrian Brigades in the city of Aleppo. He adds, but when Saudi Arabia realised that the brigades Qatar was supporting were more significant, the Saudis started stealing Qatar's brigades and supporting groups like the Islam Brigade in Ghouta near Damascus, which was attacked with chemical weapons a few months ago. 
Making reference to an Islamic Front treaty, Barrel writes, a look at the treaty of the supposedly moderate Islamic Front, which is cooperating with the Free Syrian Army and would become Washington's new ally, reveals its purpose as the establishment of a state in Syria run by Islamic law. Barrel asked the question, is this a new version of the Muslim Brotherhood or the twin brother of the Taliban? It seems that Washington will need a powerful magnifying glass to tell the difference. The author concludes, at the moment, it seems President Bashar Assad is the only hope left in Syria. US Secretary of State John Kerry continues to claim that there will be no place for Assad in the new Syrian government to arise, but he also cannot say who his replacement will be. The only certainty is the dead, injured and the refugees that continue to fuel this war. The Wall Street Journal features an article by Maria Abi Habib titled Syrian Al-Qaeda says it is open to alliance with more secular rebels in reference to a recent interview with the leader of Al-Qaeda's Syrian branch. The author says that the leader of Al-Qaeda's Syria branch said in his first televised interview that he doesn't want to monopolise power and floated the idea of an alliance with secular rebels. The head of the Nusra Front, Abu Mohammed al Ghulani, insisted in the interview with Al Jazeera aired on Thursday that Syria must emerge from its civil war as a state based on Islamic law or Sharia. She adds the Nusra Front and ISIS are two of the most potent fighting forces among Syrian rebels and they increasingly dominate the rebel side of the war at the expense of more secular western backed groups such as the Free Syrian Army. Nusra is better funded and trained than its secular counterparts. Last week, Islamist rebels drove the FSA out of its headquarters in northern Syria and took over warehouses storing US military aid. The author writes that the interview also suggested a growing split between Nusra and ISIS. Mr al Ghulani condemned those who go to the extreme and denounced non-devout Muslims as apostates, a concept embraced by many al-Qaeda followers. By denouncing ISIS and its harsh treatment of minorities, Mr al Ghulani drove a deeper wedge between the two groups. The author added, some within the opposition's political leadership have expressed guarded optimism that they can reason with the Nusra Front as opposed to ISIS. Nusra is made up of mostly Syrian fighters, while ISIS is largely foreign fighters from the Middle East and Europe. Referring to the reaction to al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abi Habib writes, al-Qaeda's brutality in Iraq alienated the local population with beheading suicide bombings of churches and bazaars and clampdowns on personal freedoms such as playing music or smoking. Those tactics prompted Mr al-Zawahiri to write a letter in 2005 to al-Qaeda's Iraq branch urging the affiliate to tone down violence because public opinion was turning against them. Al Ghulani has rejected in advance the results of Geneva II and denounced the Western backed Syrian National Coalition. He's quoted as saying, We won't recognise any results that come out of the Geneva II conference, nor will the children or women of Syria. The SNC, which is attending the conference, is confined to newsrooms. In reality, they have no presence on the ground. The author concluded Assad's forces have made important tactical gains in recent months and are seen as more viable by the day, as opposed to the rebels who have succumbed to infighting. An article appears in Gulf News headlined, Al Nusra does not seek to rule Syria, chief says. Speaking of the Al Nusra front leader, the article says Al Ghulani rarely gives public messages and had never appeared on a public forum until his interview with the pan Arab news channel Al Jazeera, part of which were aired late on Wednesday. The article says Ghulani was filmed from behind, his face wrapped in a black scarf with only his hands visible. He proposed a legal council made up of Muslim clerics and thinkers who supported the Syrian uprising, even if they were outside the country. The Al Nusra Front pledged loyalty to Al Qaeda, which has in turn embraced the group as its franchise in Syria. The article says that the Al Nusra Front members have been seen executing Muslims they deem apostates or takfiris. Such tactics, as well as a growing intolerance of rival Syrian rebel groups and critical activists, have made local residents wary of Islamist forces in rebel-held northern Syria. But in the interview, Ghulani pledged to stop the takfiri phenomenon, saying, We strongly condemn those who go to extremes in declaring takfir of individuals or a general group of people. We consider all Muslim societies to be Muslim, and we consider Syrian society in general to be Muslim. We reject those who say this society is an apostate one. Now let's take a look at the top headlines from international papers. 
Russia's Moscow Times leads its front page with the headline Khodorkovsky's infinite term to end. The International New York Times leads its front page with the headline Bank Deal Will Test Goal of United Europe. UAE's Gulf News leads with the headline India and US in talks to end diplomatic row. Finally, Jerusalem Post leads with the headline Defying White House, Senators Submit New Iran Sanctions Bill. For more updates, please visit levant.tv. Goodbye for today.